Silly dagger, and that's not how banana peels work. Hey there fam, I'm back with another fantastic video on another cool and obscure JRPG I've recently played. Okay, let's be real. If you watch my channel, you likely have heard of The Last Story as it actually has close ties to the game that nets my channel the most views, Xenoblade. Yes, as some of you may know, Xenoblade is not the only game of its kind. In fact, there are three games that spawned from the same effort that gave us Xenoblade in North America. For those who don't know, in 2011, a large fan campaign began in the West called Operation Rainfall. This campaign was created with the intent of convincing Nintendo of America to localize three Japan-exclusive Wii JRPGs. RPGs, Xenoblade Chronicles, Pandora's Tower, and The Last Story. We really remember Xenoblade as the only game in this movement because it's the one that managed to garner a cult success and is the only one Nintendo ever really talks about. The thing that made this effort feasible, aside from the massive fan outpouring both online and with physical mail sent to Nintendo, was the fact that these games were already slated for release in Europe and had already had voice cast and localization done there, which is why all three of these games are filled with that sweet, sweet British VA, just injected into my goddamn veins. After nearly 18 months of the effort attempting to get all three games ported over, they were able to reach the funding and gain the influence to bring them all stateside, with Nintendo only publishing Xenoblade, the marketable one of the three, and Xseed Games scooping up the last story in Pandora's Tower. It really is a marvel that hardcore JRPG fans were able to form such a vocal community outcry and make a monumental change like this, especially in the late age of the Wii, when Nintendo had their head jammed so far up the proverbial ass of the casual market they couldn't hear the train wreck of the Wii U coming from a mile away. With all that said, no one ever really talks about The Last Story or Pandora's Tower anymore, not in the way that they talk about Xenoblade at least, and I think it would be a great disservice to have these games fall to the wayside and just be forgotten about with time. The way I see it, Operation Rainfall was the reason that I got to experience my favorite game of all time, so all of those fans must have seen something in these titles that would make them worth all of that effort. With that said, let's jump into the tale of the last story. Well, where did the last story come from? Well, it's a game created by... and developed by... Well, this is awkward. Yeah, I never really intended to review another Hironobu Sakaguchi and Mistwalker game like this again, but uh, here we are. Life is funny, ain't it? After my middling opinions on Blue Dragon, which uh, part 3 is really coming guys, it's coming soon, I promise. A lot of my initial excitement was gone when I saw on the box art that Sakaguchi and Mistwalker had worked on this. Yeah, this game is so obscure that it took until I bought it to figure out who developed it. But honestly, I had dreaded covering this game when I had received it in the mail four months ago. And after sitting on it for a few months, I had honestly considered not covering it at all. But I am very much glad that I finally bit the bullet and gave this game a shot because there is a lot that I loved about it. Let's be frank, it's not perfect, and I definitely have a number of issues with the game as a whole, but despite some nagging qualms I have, I really enjoyed my time with this game and it easily beats Blue Dragon as a much more memorable and enjoyable experience by a long shot. In the last story, you play a Zale, a rather meek but kind-hearted young man who has formed an alliance with a ragtag misfit group of mercenaries who all dream to become knights one day. In this group is a number of characters with their own distinct personalities that help carry out a lot of this early game. You have Dagrin, Zale's best friend and closest comrade who follows in his dream to become a knight, whilst also being a bit of a mentor and rival to Zale. There's also Yurik, a mage with an eye patch who's an edgy sad boy who doesn't like to talk to people. Then there's Lowell. 
he's a flirt. And Morania, a hippie healer white mage who loves the earth and sees that it's dying or some shit. But none of them matter, because Zale is also friends with the greatest character in all of video games, Seren. Seriously guys, Seren is the baddest bitch ever, and I mean that with the utmost praise. Who is Seren? Well, she's a give no fucks chick who enjoys drinking profusely, telling it as it is, and fucking up anyone who gets in the way of her and her alcohol. She has so many amazing moments, and although she's not necessarily a plot critical character, she just oozes of this charm and charisma that makes her stand out as one of my favorite characters in gaming, no joke. I would drink Seren's bath water. Why did I write this? You know, I was gonna do like a whole Seren drinking counter thing, but that's way too easy. Can I get a fucking Seren being a boss ass bitch counter, please? Maybe, maybe not. I've got plans of my own. Oh, you pulled a bloke or something? Shut up, you! Ah! Thank you. In any case, the game starts off with the crew in the midst of one of their missions, and just as things seem to be going all too smoothly, both Zale and Seren find themselves ambushed and surrounded by skeletons, with Seren being stricken down and Zale being left with grief. They pull that fake death bullshit way too soon. Like, I would have been legitimately mad if they killed Seren this early. Seren! I don't want to be alone anymore. I'm sick of it! Sick of all the pain! I should have been the one to fill your dark soul with light! Yeah, this might be a good time to mention the voice work in this game. It's not nearly as consistent as something like Xenoblade, and it shows. Sometimes the VA is really good, and it displays a wide array of emotions. Sometimes it's, uh... Seren's handing out cash for something that's not alcohol. Somebody call a doctor. Don't go wasting it, yeah? Oh, make sure I spend it wisely. Doctor! Is there a doctor in the house? Well, let's do this again sometime. I'm gonna have a wander. I'll see you back at the- Sounds good. Doctor! Doctor! <sighs> yeah, sometimes it's pretty cringe. Verania! What are you saying? What are you doing here? Uh, we came to rescue you. I'm telling you guys, this is the funniest game ever made. Whether it's intentional or not, the mixture of these awkward voice takes with these jokes that only kind of land, or that are told in the weirdest of times, it's amazing. Getting back on track, in response to Zale's manic whining, a mysterious force grants him a mystical power that is the crux of both the game's story and gameplay. Gathering. Gathering is Zale's signature MC superpower. What is it exactly? It's drawing aggro. Plain and simple, it's a button that draws all enemies to you and off of your teammates and it's super abusable. The ability itself isn't broken, but the context you use it in and the attacks you get later on definitely make it broken and by extension make the combat trivial. It's one of many reasons why I think that the gameplay system in the last story is flawed and pretty shallow, but I'll get into that later. After they escape their encounter in the ruins, the group travel to Lazula City where they've received a job from its ruler, Count Arganen, to become bodyguards for the wedding ceremony of the Count's niece and prospective queen of Lazulus, Princess Cal the group expects this to be their big breakthrough job of becoming knights in Lazlus Castle. Along the way, we see a lot of subtle moments where the disdain for the group's status as mercenaries is seen by the general public, and it's a nice tone setter that allows us to see why the group is perceived as outsiders who just want to be accepted in society. There now, hold on to me. Don't be afraid. Yeah, don't be afraid of creepy eye patch kid. He won't bite. Thanks, crazy lady! Crazy lady! Hold up in a tavern, the group decide to lay low until the ball and wedding ceremony take place. After Seren manages to drink all of the beer in the tavern, she sends Zale out to go get some. My glass looks kind of empty. Barman! Fill me up! I'm really sorry, but we've run out. Of everything. I never thought you'd drink so much. Until we get some more in, we're totally dry. Right then. Zale! Ever wanted to be a delivery boy? 
and he instead runs into a girl by the name of Lisa, who is fleeing from the Castle Knights. He later learns that Lisa is Princess Callista in disguise. What ensues is probably my favorite aspect of this game's plot, and that's this boy meets girl love story between Zale and Callista. The love the two characters seem to resonate with one another is palpable and feels genuine and real. Callista is a sheltered girl who wants to see the world, and Zale is an adventurer who wants stability and status in his life. The contrast in their lives makes their attraction toward each other seem natural, and having a rather magical night together where Callista and Zale share personal stories and secrets with one another, their love at first sight attitude just seeps of corny charm and I'm all here for it. Zale soon takes Callista back to the tavern where he gets ragged on by Seren and Lowell. Anyway, now that's settled, time for a nice bath. Care to join me, Lisa? You've been running around all day. You must be all hot and sweaty. Oh, well, yes. What? Seren? What? Is there a problem? Oh, you want to get in with us, don't you? No, I, I mean, I'm not saying... It reminds me, Lisa keeps asking about you. Really? Yeah, she was wondering if you always take a girl to a bar and play her with drinks when you're trying to get her in the sack. And after attending some personal business, she returns home. Zale and company head out to the castle the next morning, where Callista and King Jeral are set to be married. There they meet the knight, General Asthar, and his pupil Sir Therius, who's arguing with Seren in the courtyard. I heard the way you said mercenary just now. And? That is what you are, is it not? I'm saying I can't stand your holier-than-thou attitude! Your delightful manners are just what one would expect from a mercenary. Oh, you really want your ass kicked, don't you? During the ball, Zale manages to sneak out and talk to Callista on the balcony, where he learns that she's essentially being forced to marry Jeral by her uncle. Oh, also, Jeral is a major douche. Jeral catches wind of their conversation and immediately grows jealous of their natural attraction toward one another, but before he can act on anything, the castle is bombarded out of nowhere by this race of creatures called the Gurak. The group then attempt to escort Callista and the Count safely. On their way out, they run into the king of the Gurak. Ganondorf? No, this is Zangarak, although he's pretty much just Ganondorf. They then get their asses beat by him and manage to become stowaways on a Gurak ship. I'll bring up the rear. Callista, are you okay? It's dark, so be careful. This is easy. No problem at all. I've explored every nook and cranny of that labyrinth of a castle. So, even in the dark... Callista! Seriously guys, intentionally or not, this might be the funniest game ever. And that's about all the plot synopsis you'll be getting from me today. Listen, this game's story is huge, and as much as I'd love to tell you all about it, I think you guys have enough info to understand the criticisms of plot points that I'll be bringing up later. With that said, we're gonna dive into critique mode from here on out. So a major spoiler warning is in order. If you at all care about experiencing this story on your own, please do, because from here on out, Everything's on the table for plot points. With that said, let's talk about one of the things that I've been most critical about with this game. It's gameplay. It's really a requirement that you enjoy the characters and plot points in order to keep yourself engaged with the last story, because the gameplay is about as shallow as a deep dive in the kiddie pool. The bulk of the gameplay in the last story consists of you walking Zale over toward an enemy and watching him hit them for you. I know that's a gross oversimplification of the combat system, but it's legitimately what you'll be doing for for nearly 80% of your combat encounters. The only real exceptions are boss fights that have some sort of gimmick attached to them or fights where you're swarmed and surrounded by a bunch of grunts. The last thing I would call the gameplay of the last story is engaging. Think a real-time version of Valkyria Chronicles, minus the need for actual tactics or real challenge. It's an action RPG coded with some strategy RTS elements. Not only do you have control of the main character, you can also issue commands to all of your units, and each encounter puts an emphasis on approaching each combat encounter with a certain positioning and often wants you to use the environment to your advantage. There are some moments where the game breaks out of its traditional gameplay style to try this stealth thing, and it's, it's really bad. Stealth mechanics in this game are broken and do not have any rhyme or reason to functioning. With how poorly they were implemented, they honestly shouldn't have been put in the game to begin with, but uh, 
they were. Speaking of broken aspects of this game, there are a number of things in the general combat system that just do not work the way they're intended and are kind of cheap. An example, you'll shortly get this ability called Slash that lets you peek out of cover with a powerful sword attack that will one-shot most monsters. What makes it and Gathering broken is that when you have Gathering activated and you hide in any cover, all of the enemies will stop and look around for you, assuming you've disappeared. This allows both you and your allies to wail on the enemies while they stand around with their thumbs up their asses with you just jumping in and out of cover. There are also these spots called summoning circles which are essentially grinding spots. Since the game is nothing but linear dungeons, your combat encounters will be fixed, so having access to these grinding spots can easily overlevel you and make the game easier than it needs to be. But without them, you risk being under leveled for the fight ahead, so they're a necessary evil I suppose. It's a shame that the last story's combat is so lackluster because I could easily see the style of gameplay that they're going for being expanded upon and made a lot more complex and unique. I feel like they made this weird action RPG and tactics hybrid system, but removed any semblance of depth for accessibility's sake. Maybe they just didn't want to scare away people from their game with a combat system that was too complex, or maybe they just didn't have the resources to make the combat more engaging. With the middling success of Miss Walker's previous efforts, I can only imagine that they didn't have the time or funding to take the game further than they may have wanted. Aside from combat, a majority of your time in the last story will be spent exploring a variety of unique locales. The characters manage to find themselves in a myriad of wacky scenarios such as a infiltrating a bandit hideout to get medicine for a dying boy, exploring a haunted mansion to rescue a ship owner's wife, exploring a pirate ship to find out the secret about Yurik's family, and being taken to a castle dungeon after being accused of treason. Need uh, booze. <sighs> Need uh, meat. Oh. The fun changes in location add to the game's sense of atmosphere and keeps things interesting for a while while giving things a bit of variation. On the note of atmosphere, while the game definitely does have its own art style, it can damper some of the experience overall. The washout of colors is an interesting aesthetic, it gives the whole game a foggy day vibe, but it also results in many of the environments blending in and looking like a mush of grey. The aspect ratio and camera angles definitely obscure much of the environment and can often make keep up with the action on screen to be a tad difficult. Overall, I would say that I like the aesthetic of the last story, but I do think it leans more on style than accessibility. When I say that your ability to like the characters in this game is make or break, I really meant it. The overall plot revolving around the outsider, which is the being that gave Zale his powers and holds the key to the land decaying and the constant conflict between the humans and the Gurak, is honestly quite dull. I was least interested in the story when it focused on Zangarak and the outsider, and I was most interested when it was about Zale and Callista's romance. The love triangle with Jeral, Zale's love for Callista coming into conflict with Dagrin's desire to be a knight and anything that involves Seren. What's it look like, mate? We're having a booze up, innit? Join us! Oh, uh, we're on duty. Thanks, though. Come on. Are you saying we ain't good enough to drink uh, with? Go, hey? go, run! She-Devil! <laughs> there are so many moments that I loved involving the character interactions in this game, so I'm only going to name a few of my highlights. First, every main character has their signature moment that gives them some notable development. Yurik's sad boy loner demeanor changes drastically after Zale saves his life from poisonous spider venom and helps him uncover the truth about his father's death. He learns that he's not alone in life, and after reading his father's diary, finds a new reason to live, which is quite touching. Later in the story, Zale observes the abhorrent behavior of the Lazulus Knights as they attack Gurak civilians, burn their homes down, and pilfer their land. This leads him to come into a conflict with his previous desires to become a knight. He realizes that the knights around him act no differently than the bandits that destroyed his home, and as a result he questions if knighthood is all it's cracked up to be. It's a deep moment of character development and shows that Zale's previous perception of these labels and statuses of knights, nobles, and mercenaries doesn't matter, and it's about the content of your character, not the title that you hold. Plus this moment holds one of Sarin's best moments in this game, and it's just amazing just swatch ah. help me you lot mm. Whoa, what are you doing <laughs> please help me i beg you save me <laughs> ah. Ah. 
Now you'd better not forget what we've done for you. Cause if you do... Yes, Mom! Uh, I, I won't, Mom! God, this character does things to me. The moment that Zale realizes that he won't bow to Count Arganin and rejects his knighthood and whisks Callista away from their marriage is a cute and cheesy moment that I can't help but get all mushy over. And the fact that the fight between Zale and General Asthar during Zale's knighthood training mirrors that of the fight between Zale and Jeral is amazing. The fight with that little cum stain is pretty epic, and his final words are actually quite touching. I just... I just want to... <laughs> to be happy. The final moment that I want to bring up is the fight with the final cocoon, and the serious mindfuck of an acid trip that happens. The boss sends Zale into a hallucination, and he's taken back to his childhood home village as it's being burned down by the bandits that killed his mother. Only this time, he's an adult who can fight back. He strikes down several bandits, each one in reality being his close friends Lowell, Morania, and Seren, which he doesn't realize in his thirst for revenge. Just when he thinks he's finished, he hears a whimper nearby, and through his lust for blood he assumes it to be another bandit, so he aimlessly strikes them down, and quickly realizes that this person that he killed is his own mother. Holy shit. What aggravates me about this part though is that they do nothing with it in the story. I would have loved to see some internal conflict with Zale where he realizes that all of the blood that he's shed as a mercenary, he's no different from the bandits that killed his mother. But they leave this powerful moment as a one-off thing, it's such a missed opportunity. While I overall like the story and characters throughout the game, there are a few moments that I've had issues with. I know, I know, people don't really like it when I'm overly critical of things, but I want to reiterate. I think that this game is good, and just because I critique it, doesn't mean that I hate it. With that said, let's talk about the story bits that I hated in this game. First, the whole dagger and being evil thing came out of nowhere, but at the same time, I could easily see it coming from a mile away. Sure, they made some obvious allusions to him working with Zangarak. That much is true and was easy to see, but they never really explain how he got in Zangarak's good graces, or why Zangarak would even choose to work with him to begin with. Plus it seemed really unnatural to me that Dagrin literally disappears in the entire endgame, but no one ever questions his absence despite him being such a plot critical character throughout the whole adventure. He literally leaves the game for hours and comes back and is suddenly evil. Plus, they never explain how he got to the Outsider before everyone else, or how he was really able to enact several key points in his plan. It just seemed really tactless, like they wanted to get to this big plot twist, but they didn't really want to explain it. I get that Dagron wanted revenge on the Empire, and did it all to reach some twisted version of his goal to live a decent life, but his ambitions and plans seem a bit extreme and like a complete character change for him. In one minute, he goes from fearless leader and mentor Dagron to, I used all of you to get my revenge and purge this world, Dagron. And it just kind of feels abrupt and unnatural. I feel like they just kind of wanted this big emotional ending, but didn't really know how to get there. Like, Dagrin turns out to be evil, and everyone's like, Oh no, Dagrin, we love you. But then he essentially gives them a big fuck you, and they're all pissed at him. But when he's on his deathbed, he's suddenly compassionate and nice to them again, and it all just seems super out of character and sketchy. Aside from that, I feel like the Count kind of fucks off way too soon before he's able to do anything, really. Like, he was obviously evil, and was poised to do something in the plot that would burden our characters, but he never uses the outsider to his advantage or stops Zale's progress in the story. Nor does he ever really impede on the relationship between Zale and Callista. He was also another missed opportunity. The ending with the humans and the Gurak immediately living together in peace is a real cop out. I don't know, it doesn't really make sense to me that the reaction of killing the king of the Gurak would result in every Gurak suddenly forgiving all humans and living with them in harmony. There would surely be a lot 
lot more strife and discrimination following that. The game would have been better off just ending with the destruction of the outsider and a vague uncertainty of how the world would be from here on out. But I want to reiterate that despite these gripes, I really enjoyed this game. The combat was a bit shallow, there were some points that made my eyes roll, but the charm of the characters and the relationships they have with one another easily made up for this game's shortcomings. With all that said, I can see why this game was pushed to the wayside and why no one really even talks about it anymore. It's a fun game, and it definitely has its strengths and highlights, but the last story lacks polish, depth, and a unique identity that separates a good JRPG from a great one. Thanks for listening to me ramble about my first experiences with one of the games in Nintendo's Operation Rainfall. Uh, you can join me next time for an inevitable look into Pandora's Tower, the most unorthodox game of the three. I don't know how to end videos, so uh... Bye! Huh? No, can't say I do. Oh, really? Uh, Still, you're a guy, right? I know how it is. <laughs> you um, have a certain mm, needs from mm, time to time. Uh, uh, Seren. But don't you worry. When you feel the urge, <sighs> this is the place to sort yourself out. <laughs> I know, uh, I know, everyone's embarrassed their first time. But once you get the hang of it, <clears throat> you'll be back for more. I I, I really don't think. Oh, don't be such a scaredy cat. You'll never get any better if you don't practice. Go on, be a man and get stuck in. Here at the arena. Uh, uh, arena? Yeah, nothing like a good old fight. Why? What did you think it was? <laughs>